Hi everyone, welcome to Teaching Thursdays at the Contemporary Classroom. In today's video, we will be taking a look at the biological concept of the nitrogen cycle using an interdisciplinary approach incorporating the history and research of scientist George Washington Carver. After watching this video, I hope you learn a little bit more about George Washington Carver's contributions not only to the scientific community, but also to the African American community post-Civil War era, and also how his contributions can play into current research and thoughts in terms of farming and agriculture today. If you want to see more content like this, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss another video. And without further ado, let's get into the video. So on this slide, I've highlighted some things that I want to call out for why I personally think that George Washington Carver is such an admirable man. So the main reason is just that this man went through so much and he just never let that stop him from achieving his goal. If you if we start in the top, he experienced a lot of hardship and turmoil because he was born into slavery and then he was taken from his family and then they were sold and they don't know what happened to his mom and eventually he managed to escape. And he searched continuously for a decent education. One of the most famous stories is that the school system that was serving him, they just didn't have enough knowledge to give him at this point. So he had to look for another school. And the nearest school that would accept African-American children was eight miles away. And George Washington Carver went to this school. So he commuted eight miles away just to get an education. So this map on the bottom shows some of the places that he traveled. In terms of everywhere in the Midwest, he traveled alone, he left his family, always in search of higher education. And eventually he did find acceptance to Highland University, which is in Kansas. Unfortunately, when he got to the university, they realized, oh my goodness, this is a black man. And they turned him away. The fact to me that he was able to take this type of discrimination and still continue to find someplace that would accept him and do his work is truly spectacular. Then when he moved to Alabama at the request of Booker T. Washington to teach at the Tuskegee Institute, he also faced a little bit of pushback. All he cared about was bettering what he considered his people. So bettering the black community. And that's like what drove him. So money didn't drive him, fame didn't drive him. It was just that he was doing goodwill for people and bringing them up from poverty. So a quote from him that I included on this slide is, it is simply service that measures success. And again, I just think that he is such an admirable person to really be driven by the goodwill of the community and to want to improve people. And I think that's why he should be talked about more in our classrooms and especially in science classrooms because he used science as a way to better the community. And I think that's what science is truly for. So the problem that George Washington Carver faced or saw when he went to Tuskegee in Alabama was the concept of sharecropping. In the South, after the Civil War, white people were still looking for ways to do mock slavery, but not really. Essentially, they would rent out their land to African American people. And then whatever they got off it, they had to share a part of their profit with the owner of the land. And of course, in theory, this sounds great. It's like, okay, so then they'll make money and then they'll just share a part of it, but they're still making money. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. So what happened was when you combine the cost of the tools plus the cost of the land, and eventually like the farmers started to realize that they weren't getting a lot of yields. They weren't getting a lot of cotton harvested. And so the less cotton they were able to harvest, the less money they were able to make. And so it was this endless cycle of debt toward the landowner. And that's why I'm saying it ended up being like a more legal form of slavery because these people would be like indebted to the white owner and would have to keep working on the land until they paid off their debt. But if they couldn't produce enough cotton, enough yields, they would never be able to do that. So this is the problem that when George Washington Carver came down to Alabama, he immediately called this as unjust, not right, and sought a way to fix this. 
When George Washington Carver began studying how to increase the cotton yields, he looked at soil chemistry of plants. So this is based on the nitrogen cycle. So as you can see on this slide, this is an example of what the nitrogen cycle looks like. There is a lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere. So up in the top here, we see the atmospheric nitrogen or N2. Our atmosphere is actually made out of 78% of atmospheric nitrogen. Nitrogen is used for plants as food. In this form, the N2 form of nitrogen, plants can't convert this into food. And in order to do that, it requires some things called nitrogen fixing soil bacteria. So this is why bacteria is good to have in the soil because some of them can fix and break down this N2 and transform it to something that plants can actually use. What George Washington Carver is looking for is he studied soil chemistry and soil composition to figure out what the nitrogen levels look like with certain plants, especially with the cotton plant. So on this slide, it shows why nitrogen is so important and why plants need it. The process in which plants make their own food is known as photosynthesis. And one of the most important pigments, which absorbs light to convert it into energy for food, is known as chlorophyll. Nitrogen is a key component of chlorophyll. This is chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, but there are many variants of the chlorophyll model molecule. But regardless of what model you're looking at, nitrogen is still an important component. Cotton is one of the crops that deplete nitrogen from the system. So unlike the legume crops that we saw in the previous slide that have that bacteria that can convert the nitrogen, all plants like cotton do, or in this case on the left hand side, cotton lettuce, all these plants do is they just suck up all the nitrogen out of the system and they're not doing anything to bring it back. So when all they're doing is taking, 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 then eventually you're going to be left with no nitrogen in your soil because nothing is replenishing it. And that's why the farmers weren't seeing any yields or any increases in their cotton. So the concept between crop rotation is that you will rotate your crops. So of course you need things like cotton, lettuce, and wheat. Those are pretty staples in the American economy at this time. So what he suggested is to rotate crops using those legume plants that have the correct nitrogen fixing bacteria. And the one he is most famous for is using peanuts. And also he suggested things like sweet potatoes and other beans. So if you rotate and you do one time cotton and then you switch to peanuts and then you go to your lettuce and then you switch to sweet potato, then you are cycling the soil and making sure that it will always be replenished and that there will always be those great things in the soil. So one of the things that George Washington Carver also did that I think was pretty progressive for his time because it's something that we're debating today is how to farm sustainably. So when he first posed this idea of crop rotation, people were like, okay, well, what are we gonna do with all these peanuts and potatoes and et cetera? And so Carver thought, you know what? That's a great question. He took it upon himself and ran in his lab thousands of experiments to figure out things to do with all these things. And he posted them in these bulletins and you'll see a few here. So he says how to grow the peanut and 105 ways of preparing it for human con consumption. For every single crop that he suggested, he looked into ways that it could be used in your shampoo, in your toothpaste, for food, and how to cook it, how to prepare it, in order to make sure that the community was thriving off of their crops as well. So they not only are getting now more of an economic benefit because they're no longer losing a lot of their cotton yields, they can also sustain themselves on the agriculture they produce if they're producing beans and sweet potatoes because those are starch components that can actually give you a healthy meal. And through all these other things that he did, if they were able to make their own things, again, this is a very sustainable organic practice, then it would benefit them in the future. So in addition to the great science and practicality and practices that Carver brought to the African American population, I also think it's worth thinking about the lessons that he brought to the greater populace. So the first thing is Carver was very invested in the arts. In fact, one of the reasons why he went to school was actually not to study like botany or plants, but to study the arts. And what he liked to do is he liked to paint and 
do representation artistic representations of the plants that he loved and cared about so much so this is why i think that arts education still is important and even has importance in science or the scientific process another thing that often is in contrast or contention with the scientific process is religion and it is worth noting that george washington carver was a man of god and he was still able to believe in God and practice science. So the two things are not irreconcilable and I think he's a good example of using both to his advantage, to be spiritually and scientifically enriched at the same time. Another thing that we have to take away is that to get to this level, you have to be so invested and so passionate and put in a lot of work, especially in when you're working in a research or project you're trying to answer a question the answer doesn't come like that overnight it takes time and the final thing that i really love that carver did is he made sure that hit all his research was accessible to the population that he wanted it to be accessible to so in the picture that says education for all you can see his jessup wagon and what he did was he went around with this wagon and demonstrated to people in the actual community how to do the crop rotation process and why it worked in addition the bulletins he published on the previous slide he also ensured made sure that through these bulletins people would be able to understand and read. So the fact that he went out to communities and made an effort to communicate to them and publish things that people could understand, I think shows that that's so valuable for him as an educator. And that's what really contributed to helping a lot of people use the crop rotation process and understand what they were doing. And so he helped people truly learn. And of course, no video is complete without looking at two sides of an issue. So one word of caution is it brings it back to an old debate between educator Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Booker T. Washington believed that people needed to work themselves up to a certain economic status in order to then start advocating themselves to white people for rights. Whereas W.E.B. W. E. B. Du Bois was saying that we shouldn't wait for that and doing that is wrong and we need to take action immediately because we face all these injustices. So George Washington Carver was actually hired at Tuskegee by Booker T. Washington and so he also believed in this type of assimilationist approach. And so I think the caution that I think I want to say is that Clearly George Washington Carver, I'm not denying that he worked extremely hard and that he overcame a lot of challenges, but I think there's danger in saying like, well, he clearly like didn't let the discrimination in the college system slash slavery slash witnessing a lynching like stop him and he still gained success. And at the same time, you have to acknowledge that it's still not right that he had to go through these things. It's not right that he couldn't get an education at Highland University. It's not right that he saw people getting lynched and it's not right that sharecropping was happening. And it makes sense that you want to educate yourself and get to a certain point, but I think sometimes it's better to also like still continue to fight as you're doing that. So George Washington Carver again does side with Booker T. Washington on this issue. So it's something that you will want to think about and explore when studying him in school. So that was some of the science and history behind the practice of crop rotation and paying homage to one of the great scientists of our time, George Washington Carver. I've linked some extra resources in the description below, so feel free to check those out if you're interested in either the science or the history behind this great inventor. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to continue learning with us. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!